All right, we're, so we've been going through the book of Revelation, so if you want to open, open the, to Revelation chapter 2, we'll be continuing our study. We're currently into the second of the seven churches, and we'll be covering the church of Smyrna today. All right, so uh, I, I do see, welcome all the new people, thank you for uh, getting in touch and coming and welcome, it's good to see you. Uh, we've, we've seen one another just from on the side of a riverbank, which was great. It was exciting to be there uh, at, uh, at Samuel's immersion. And um, so uh, we're excited and we just want to welcome you all. But uh, we have been going through Revelation where we're really looking at this lovely letter that John wrote on the island of Patmos. And uh, this is John the son of Zebedee, the disciple of Yeshua. And he wrote it uh, to the seven communities in Asia Minor, which is uh, modern-day Turkey. And uh, so today, for instance, Smyrna is where the modern-day city of Izmir, or Izmir is, is located. And so uh, we talked about that, we talked about how each of these letters was written as, as more like a corporate letter. Uh, as you know, the entire book of Revelation went out to all these seven churches, so in some ways, every church got to read every other church's mail, to a certain extent. But what it means for us today is that we can look at these letters and realize that if the shoe fits, then we need to wear it. We need to listen to what each of these letters has to say and ask ourselves the question, does this apply to us? And so uh, the next slide, we go through, each letter goes through this basic structure, starts out by saying to the angel of the community in such and such a place, and then goes and describes some of Yeshua's attributes, repeating several of the attributes that we covered in chapter one a couple weeks ago. Then the Lord would uh, give a praise. And he says, he would always start with, I know the works that you do. I know this or such and such about you. Uh, that you are such and such and such. Okay, and so there's a blessing and a praise for the congregation. Then the Lord would turn and say, but I have this against you, and bring a correction, uh, something that was wrong with that congregation that needed to be addressed. And then right at the end, Yeshua always gives hope. He gives the, uh, the promise for everyone who would overcome. And so that's the structure, and so let's go right into the background of the congregation in Smyrna. So, Smyrna, as I found out, is a very difficult word to spell. <laughs> I misspelled it almost every single time I type, and you can hardly see it down there in black. I'll, I, I'll, you got it right. I did get it right, that's good, yeah. So my spell check eventually picked it up. But this is uh, modern day Izmir, and there's uh, the ancient city of Smyrna in the, uh, just some of the uh, columns of the different temples that were a part of the city of Smyrna. So Smyrna was about 65 kilometers north of Ephesus. So we talked about Ephesus last week. And uh, this is just north of there. At the time when John was writing, it had a population of around 200,000, which would have made it a very large city in that time, in that, in that place. It was right at the mouth of the Hermes River. And just like Ephesus, Smyrna was a very important center for the imperial cult. So the cult worshipping the emperor. The citadel of Smyrna was actually often compared to a crown, and we'll see a lot of, there's a lot of coins and inscriptions that will show a wreath, because the, a crown, when you read crown in the scriptures, most of the times, and you've probably seen it in, in the Ben-Hur and different movies, that they have a crown of wreaths. Uh, it could be a wreath of olive branches, or laurel, or pine branches, or even celery. Uh, you know, and they would give these out as awards at games. So who knew that you could have a crown made out of celery? Uh, see, I knew we should have kept that celery. We have a pile of celery that we gave to the dog the other day because we didn't know what else to do with it. We should have made a crown out of it. But, um, so nearly 20% of the inscriptions from earlier contain that depiction of a crown when talking about Smyrna. By the time of Emperor Domitian, which was 81 to 96 AD, the emperor of worship had become compulsory. And every Roman citizen was commanded to worship and burn incense 
uh, on the altar to the Godhead of Caesar. And then they would receive the certificate. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, we actually have some archaeological evidence. Uh, this is a parchment from that time. Uh, this parchment happens to be from around, I think, 150. But in this parchment, here's what it says. It says it was a request for one of these certificates. It says, to those who have been appointed to preside over the certificates from Inaris Archaeus, from the village of Theooxenus, together with his children, Aeus and Hera, who reside in the village of Theodelphia. We have always sacrificed to the gods, and now in your presence, according to the regulations, we have sacrificed and offered libations and tasted the sacred things. We ask you to give us a certificate that we have done so. May you fare well. And then we also have a response to this, which is the actual certificate. And the actual certificate says, or the one that we, one of the ones we have says this. It says, we, the representatives of the emperor, Serenoas and Hermaeus have seen you sacrificing. And then there would be the dead. All right? So this was the uh, requirement for the entire empire of Rome. And as you can see, offering a sacrifice to the emperor probably had very little to do with worship, but had everything to do with politics. Okay? Had everything to do with uniting the empire, making sure you weeded out the dissidents. Anybody who wasn't willing to worship Caesar, therefore must be a dissident. And so we, we see this as the history, we see it written about in multiple different authors, that this was uh, what was going on in Smyrna. Smyrna was a, uh, a place, one of the three main cities in Asia Minor, so Ephesus being the primary, and Smyrna, and um, we'll get to the next one next week. But uh, these three cities, were the head of this imperial cult and were proud to be so by the way and very happy to have attained that honor what we do learn about the congregation of smyrna we actually learn like the only bit that we read about in the scriptures is actually from this letter so when you're reading through the scriptures that's the only place that the name smyrna is going to come up however we do have some historical documents uh, from later on uh, a, a couple hundred years later, a historian uh, by the name of Eusebius wrote about a gentleman by the name of Polycarp. Now, how many people have heard of Polycarp? I was, uh, I was really blessed. I, again, I love reading through some of the, all the writings of the church fathers and uh, just reading what they said. And Polycarp was amazing. So Polycarp was born in 65 AD, approximately, and he died, as far as we can tell, on the 23rd of February, 155 AD. I know that's very specific, but that's because it was an official execution, and the Romans were pretty good about writing these things down. So an early historian, Eusebius, he writes that at the age of 86, Polycarp was burned alive as the 12th martyr of Smyrna. His words have echoed through the ages. This is what Polycarp said right before he was tied up. He says, 86 years I have served Messiah, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme the king who saved me? And there's, there's quite a bit more that, uh, that Polycarp... Now, this was the oldest picture of Polycarp I could find. Uh, it is from 526, so it's still hundreds of years after Polycarp lived. It's one of those, um, uh, I don't know what you call it. This, it's like, not a, it's not a stained glass, it's with the stones, mosaics, it's a mosaic. So it's a, a sort of mosaic that's up on a wall, and uh, it shows a list of all sorts of different martyrs. If you actually find this, uh, it uh, was done in Italy, and uh, so it's the oldest picture we have um, of him. He probably didn't have a halo, but... He was obviously a holy man. Okay. That being said, there were some other amazing things that Polycarp said. So Polycarp was known. Why do I bring up Polycarp? Well, he was the bishop of Smyrna. He was the one who studied under the Apostle John. All right. So let's talk about this. So he, he was born in 65. This letter of Revelation was written in the 90s. So he would have been a 30-some-year-old man, give or take, 25 to 35, somewhere in there. 
and he became the bishop of Smyrna. Now, after, um, after John was released from Patmos, he ended up in Ephesus, but Polycarp studied under him for a while. And this, uh, we actually, we get a lot of the writings of John through Polycarp. I can almost quote the entire book of John through some of the things that he's, that he's said and, and Eusebius writes about him. And so there's just, he writes so many things, but he's just, I'm, I mean, I'm in awe of somebody. He's, he's 86, he's standing before the tribunal, and the, um, they're threatening his life. They're threatening him, yes, it's a political play, we all knew, they, everybody knew this, and they're like, well, just, you know, throw the sprinkle of salt and be done with it. And he says, no. I says, well, the, the, the magistrate was really angry, he says, well, I'll throw you to the lions. He says, okay, go ahead. I will. And then after a bit, the magistrate says, well, fine, we're going to burn you at the stake. And then um, and he says, well, you keep threatening, well, go ahead and do it. And so what happened, as it turned out, the, the whole city came and uh, was enraged at this dissident against the emperor. And um, even though he was 86, they wanted to throw him to the lions. But then the magistrate said, well, actually, uh, the emperor shut down the, um, the uh, what is that? Colosseum. It shut down the Colosseum, so we're not allowed to do that. So then they decided, well, okay, we can't throw him to the lions, so we're going to throw him to the state, at the state. What's interesting is that Polycarp had received that in a vision already, a dream, and that he had deliberately not run away, knowing that they were coming for his life. He had no, no problem standing there and receiving that, and in the end, the flames would not even consume him. The entire town built a fire around him, and, he, and set it alight, and it says that instead of burning, his body glowed like refined gold or bronze, and he did not die. So eventually the magistrate saw him and told one of the soldiers to stab him with a spear, and so the soldier eventually stabbed him, and it says blood and water poured out and extinguished the fire. But the people were so angry that they Burnt him on him. Uh, he was already stabbed and, you know, dead. dead. So they burnt his body. So this is Polycarp. All right. This is, the, this is the place that Yeshua is writing this letter. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 8. To the angel of Messiah's communities in Smyrna write, Thus says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life, I know your tribulation and your poverty, yet you are rich. As well as the slander of those who say that they are Jewish and are not, but are a syn synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, so that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation for ten days, but be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach is saying to Messiah's communities. The one who overcomes shall never be harmed by the second death. So let's see, how does Yeshua identify himself? Well, he starts out by telling and reminding them that he is the first and the last, and that he is the one who has been raised from the dead. Well, it's really interesting because first and the last, Smyrna, Ephesus, and Pergamon, those three cities, were known as the first of Asia. That was their title. They were the first of Asia. They were the prominent cities, and they were given that title by the emperor because of their loyalty to the emperor. It was a position of prominence in the Roman Empire, and it meant that they had self-rule. So they ruled their city because of their loyalty. However, Yeshua is not impressed with political rulership. He has watched empires rise and fall. He has raised those empires and caused them to fall. Those things do not impress him. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the first and he is the last. And this is something that every ruler, every prime minister, every politician, and every president should remember. 
It is God who exalts and God who abases. If you want more on that, go look at the life of, what was it, the leader of uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar? Do you remember him? Remember him? He, he built his empire and said, look at this empire that I have made. Yeah, just go read that story in Daniel. It's worth reading if you want to see how God deals with leaders of empires and nations. Then Yeshua goes into this praise. Yeshua praises the congregation for being rich. He says that they are, they are rich in spite of their po poverty. So obviously there's, a, there's what riches is Yeshua talking about and what poverty is he talking about. Well, it, based upon the context, we can see that he's talking about actual poverty. He says that you are actually poor. You, you know, because they did not get that certificate, they weren't allowed to do business. They, they were not legally allowed to buy and sell. They weren't allowed to have a trade. They weren't allowed to do these things because they would not sacrifice to Caesar. Now, like I said, it was just a pinch of incense that they had to throw on the altar, but they refused to do that. And so therefore, they never got that certificate, which meant it was very difficult to buy and sell, to get food to feed their family. And poverty hit their families. This, we watched this happen in the uh, Soviet Union with believers as well. They were not able to buy and sell, and many ended up being sold into slavery to make money to feed their families. And this is what was happening. They lived in, a, in an extremely wealthy city, but they were not able to legally participate in trade because of their faithfulness to Yeshua. And this is very similar to what is still happening today. In many of the Islamic nations, believers or people of the book must pay the jizya tax. And they are taxed in such a way that they are impoverished. Many of the, their neighbors will say, well, why don't you just accept Islam? Just pretend to accept Muhammad, and then you won't have to pay this tax anymore. But they refuse. They say, I cannot worship another god. It's also what's happening in North Korea and, in, and in, uh, in, in communist China at the moment. We know that, that uh, if you refuse to, to uh, do everything that the, uh, the communistic government or dictators demand, then you are impoverished and thrown in jail and, and, and abused and those sorts of things. So the riches that Yeshua is talking about is probably the same riches that he talks about later to the church in Laodicea. Remember Laodicea? We'll get to that at the end of the seven churches. And he says to Laodicea, look, you need to buy from me gold that is refined by the fire. White clothes, which are the righteous deeds of the saints, we learn about that later in Revelation, that would cover your nakedness. And I salve that you might see. The congregation in Smyrna had these riches. They were rich in the things of God, in the eternal glory, the gold, in the righteous acts, the, the white clothes, and the eye salve. They could see the truth. And even though they had been lied about, which we see in this passage, they were, they were slandered, even though they were lied about and falsely accused of doing all sorts of things which they did not do, they had been faithful to Yeshua. What about the correction? Well, there isn't one. There's no correction. And uh, a lot of times in it, when you notice a pattern and all of a sudden something's different from the pattern, it's something to take note of. There is no correction for the congregation in Smyrna. There's only an encouragement from the Lord and an admonition. One thing about physical persecution is that congregations that are going through physical persecution are often very pure. God refines them. They are beautiful. They reflect the glory of God. I just I remember listening to Ravi Zacharias talk about some of the congregations he's been able to visit in, in a lot of different nations. And he says, the churches in the East who are going through persecution are beautiful. They are filled with the glory of God, the love of God between each one of them as they whisper their songs because they can't sing loudly lest their neighbors dog them in, yet they worship the Lord anyway. They are beautiful. 
Yeshua acknowledges that they have been falsely accused by those who claim to be Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now this is very harsh language. This statement itself has been taken out of context and was used by different uh, Catholic or I'd say Christian regimes throughout the ages uh, to persecute Jewish minorities. It has been used to bring about horrendous things in the name of Jesus against the Jewish people. And so for this, for this statement, many Jewish people say, well, see, that's anti-Semitic. Well, is it? Well, let's think about this. What is the proper way to understand this statement? Firstly, what had happened to Paul in the book of Acts was happening here in Smyrna. So if you remember in Paul's time, when Paul was going from city to city, he'd go to the synagogue, he would preach the, the good news of Yeshua, he would show from the scriptures, the, the Torah, that, that Yeshua was the Messiah, the promised one of Israel. We show from the prophets that Yeshua is the promised one and that we owe him our allegiance. After a while, many Jewish people would believe and many Jewish people would not believe. And those who did not believe would go to the ruling authorities of that city and cause the political authorities to come against Paul and the other believers with accusations of sedition. They were saying that they are teaching stuff that is causing people to serve another Lord. Another Lord other than Caesar. And see, every, every Roman citizen was required by law to say that Caesar was Lord. And so what was happening in those times is that the, you know, Paul and Silas got arrested and thrown in jail. Okay, they got beaten with whips, they got stoned on one account, they, you know, lots of different things happened in lots of different cities. But this thing continued on throughout the first 400 years after Yeshua. But by the time that John is writing this, it was the, um, the political authorities had raised the stakes, if you will. They had made the penalty for not worshipping Caesar death. Well, what about the Jewish people? See, the Jewish people had been given an exception according to Caesar because of all the wars that had been fought and whatever. Uh, they were tired of those. So they gave the Jewish people an exception. If you were Jewish, you did not have to worship Caesar because they knew that the Jewish people would rather kill themselves than worship Caesar. So now here's the problem. What about when you have Jews and Gentiles who are one in a Jewish Messiah? They look Jewish, they're following a Jewish Messiah, and yet part of the Jewish people who don't believe in Yeshua call them apostates. Well, this is exactly what happened. They were simply called no longer Jewish. You are no longer Jewish, and therefore you must worship Caesar. The death sentence wasn't that common. We see in Eusebius' time that, from, that Polycarp was only the 12th martyr. He was 85 years at that time. So by the time, between, between the time when this book of Revelation was written, so when he was in his 30s, to the time that he's 80, so over that 50 year time, you're only talking about 12 people uh, that had been put to death. But even so, persecution was very common. But in, back to this statement of calling those who are Jewish and yet are not but lie, they are a synagogue of Satan. That still sounds very, very harsh. But did you know that the Jewish community in Qumran, at the same time as Jesus, you know Qumran is just, it's just a little, right near the Dead Sea, uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. In that community, they write this. They wrote of, about the Jewish people in Jerusalem. They said that they were the congregation of Belial. What does that mean? Oh, wait, it's the same as saying the synagogue of Satan. So here is a Jewish sect pointing at the apostate Jewish people, those who had bought their position from Caesar, so the Sadducees, and those who no longer followed the Torah of God, but rather set their own law as more important. 
They called them the synagogue of Satan. So this is language inside the family. John the Immerser also seems to, it looks like that he actually studied with the Essenes for some time, talking about John the Baptist, uh, but he, he says this, when the Sadducees and Pharisees came down to be immersed, he said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore produce fruit worthy of repentance. Now I could quote you from Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and so many other prophets where they use this exact same language to those who are no longer following the Lord God of Israel. But what we have to look at is, is it possible that those who refuse to accept Jesus, Yeshua, as the Jewish Messiah, were actually the apostate Jews? They were the ones who were no longer following in the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeshua said that if you believed in Abraham, if Abraham was your father, then you would love me. Because before Abraham was, I am. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. But this is no different than the children of Israel in the wilderness with the golden calf, or Baal Peor. In those times, Adonai brought about immediate judgment on the Israelites because of their unbelief and unfaithfulness. Yeshua is returning as the judge of both Jews and Gentiles. And there will be many people who cry out to Yeshua, but Lord, Lord, didn't we do these wonderful things in your name? Didn't we heal the sick and cast out demons in your name? And in Matthew 27, verse 23, it says, Depart from me. I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Finally, just because Yeshua is declaring judgment on those who claim to be Jewish, does, not give up, does that give us the same right to bring about that judgment? Just because Yeshua is declaring this judgment, does that give us the right to enforce that judgment? Does Christendom, looking at Christianity for the entirety of the last 2,000 years, have the permission from Yeshua to label all Jewish people as the synagogue of Satan? Absolutely not. Adonai has appointed one judge, and that is not me. All judgment has been given to Yeshua. Yeshua told us in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, and I might have this one up there, no, that with the same judgment that we judge others, that we ourselves will be judged. We are called to judge with righteous judgment. But that means seeing if a person's life and teaching lines up with the Word of God. It does not mean that we should use the power of the state to force people to convert. There is an old saying that those convinced against their will are of the same opinion still. Yeshua never forced anyone to follow him. In Revelation, Yeshua follows these words with an encouragement to the congregation in Shemona. He tells them that it's not, he doesn't do it by simply saying everything's going to be golden and rosy and you're just going to be blessed and, and everything's going to be perfect and as soon as you accept Yeshua, it's going to be a great life. He doesn't do that, does he? No, he tells them the truth. He says that the time of testing is coming, but it's only going to be for a short time. And that physical death is not final. It is not the end of our lives. Yeshua is the one who gives that crown of life. You know, Smyrna is called a crown, but Yeshua is the one who gives the crown of life. He's the one who causes us to be immune from the second death. That the second death cannot touch us. Whoever overcomes, even if we die, we will live forever and we will never be harmed again. So how do we apply this to our lives? I know that 
for many of us who've been watching the elections in the States, I know I have, um, being an American, for those of you who have not, it's still not decided. And it may not be decided for another, another month if, if everything goes the way it seems to be going. In our nation, though, we have not yet succumbed to physical persecution. Not really. Yes, we're, we're made fun of, and, and we are derided at work. We are, you know, when I tell people, you know, simply where I stand on biblical things, uh, you know, they look at me as though I came from another planet. But Yeshua doesn't judge the way that the world judges. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where rust and moths destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust cannot destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. This is something that the congregation in Smyrna got right. You know, we, we do value wealth, but God values holiness. The world values what we wear, but the righteous, our righteous deeds are the white garments that we will wear in heaven. What we do. The world will, will value, you know, going along with the, the majority. But Yeshua what values when we go along with Him. And the only treasure that we can truly take with us are other people. You know, doing His will and going into all the world and preaching the good news and rescuing as many people as we can from hell. Working with the Lord, because that's His commission. And we get to work with him in those fields. So are we clothed in righteousness? Do our deeds demonstrate that we are right before God? How do we respond when people lie about us? Should we get angry and defensive? What did Yeshua say when we are persecuted that we should do? Didn't he say in Matthew chapter 5 that we are supposed to pray for those who persecute us? To love our enemies? To do good to those who are doing ill to us? Because if we only do good to those who are doing good to us, well, everybody does that. But no, we are supposed to be like our Father in heaven, where we are doing good to people who are treating us badly. This is how we are supposed to gain eternal rewards. But we are not alone. Yeshua is with us. Just as he was with the congregation in Smyrna, he tells them, do not fear, because I'm the one who died and yet I am alive. He reminds them that he has gone there before us. We have a good model to follow. He was mistreated. He was lied about. He was falsely accused. And yet he responded with love and extended forgiveness even while hanging on the cross. And we are called to follow in his footsteps. Amen. Abba Father, I'm asking that these words would change our lives, that your word would be that seed in our hearts. Lord, that you would truly plant this deep in our hearts, that we would respond just like you responded, that our hearts, Lord, would ache in prayer for those who are persecuting that we truly would pray for them, Lord, and, and love them with the love that you can provide. It is beyond us, Lord, and it is too difficult for us to do alone. But we are not alone, and it is with your strength that we can do these things. In Yeshua's precious name. Amen. 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 Now, um, I know that the, I know that, I know for my, for my sake, the, the election, the, U the U.S. has really put me in a turmoil. <laughs> it has. There's no doubt about it. And, and I know I'm supposed to be trusting in the Lord all the time, but I sometimes question what He's doing. And so, so I just, um, I want you to know that the Lord is still on the throne. Regardless of what happens, 
Let me, it's just a little story about what happened in China when China uh, went from, you know, they had the revolution and they, they chose communism as a direction that they wanted to go. One of the things that the leaders in the church came out and told us was that they realized eventually that there was absolutely nothing they could do to affect the government. There was literally, you know, they had tried and tried and tried, but there was nothing that they could do. So they stopped trying. And they simply went out and fulfilled the Great Commission in spite of the government, regardless of what happens. And I think that is probably a good lesson for us, that regardless of what happens, I, I am praying for Donald Trump, yes, I'm praying that he is elected, but even if he is not, we are called to fulfill the Great Commission. We are called to love our enemies, regardless of what happens. All right, so I just want to encourage you in that way. All right, um, we, uh, I don't know what time it is, and I forgot my watch. Anybody got the time? 13 minutes past. 13 minutes past, which means we have time for a couple of questions. If there's any questions, you'll have to speak loudly, and then I'll repeat your question, um, either on Revelation or on, on the election or on anything. <laughs> I mean, I know. Yeah, go for it. Anything? Yes, Stanley? Uh, I, I believe that uh, Donald Trump will be re-elected regardless of what's going on at present and all the um, corruption that's been going on in the uh, polling booths where people are not allowing you know, spectators to come and examine what's happening and how votes have been held back uh, for a period of time to see what's going on. So all these things are going on. The same as with Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, he wasn't going to get into power according to the media. And it's the same thing there. But I, I, I just had to face that. Deep down, I just mm -hmm. know that he's going to get there. And that God's going to have his way. Oh. May, may it be so. So he's uh, referring to all of the what seems to be corruption. So there are multiple court cases that are, that are being pushed through for all of these different uh, issues of corruption. Uh, there was, um, there, like in, in Pennsylvania, there's the, for whatever reason, they allowed election to be post-dated on the two to three days after the election, uh, which has never happened before, and that is actually already in the, in the court system. And so that's going to be pushed back up to the Supreme Court, probably, uh, whether or not those votes will even be counted. And there's a lot of other things going on. And um, so in all of that, um, you know, this is probably going to be like 2000s. So it could take another 30 days before we actually know who the president of the United States is. So don't, don't expect it to be done over the next couple of days. What happened to the congregation in Smyrna? What happened to the congregation in Smyrna? So it's interesting, the two congregations in the letters that did not receive any criticism, they lasted the longest. So the two congregations, if, for those of you who know history, so in six, about 670, uh, Muhammad's born and comes through and, and then his followers came up through and uh, defeated, so it was a couple hundred years after, they came up through Turkey and defeated Turkey, right? So the, um, the caliphs at that time basically conquered Turkey, but it's interesting that the two, there's two uh, congregations that don't have any criticisms from Yeshua, those two lasted the longest. Of all the congregations, uh, they lasted the longest. They outlived the Roman Empire, and uh, so so much for worshiping the emperor. But they outlived the emperor. A long live, you know, long live the Lord. The Lord just, uh, you know, was able to to minister. And look, um, there's a, uh, you know, even there's even, uh, you know, the Lord is still still got things in plan. I think for Turkey, uh, there's things going on. We have friends uh, that are working. Yeah, and um, so it's just a, a great blessing. I can't say much, of course. But, um, but yes, yeah, so that's, that's what happened to the congregation in Smyrna is eventually Islam came through and, and conquered the city, uh, but it outlived the Roman Empire and it lived longer than most of the other congregations. The ones that had the severest criticism, the letters, they were the first to go. They disappeared first. So that's, that's basically what we know of Smyrna. Because it's modern day Ismir, and so um, 
it's still a city. So it still exists as a city, whereas Ephesus is kind of just a ruin. Uh, Ismir is, is a massive city still. And um, may the Lord raise up many congregations in Ismir. So, yes, Bernie. Yeah, we can pray for the U.S. Sure. How about we just, uh, we'll go ahead and stand and then um, before we, we, we will pray for the U.S. Are there any other questions uh, before we close? Looking, looking. No? Yes? Yes.